All right, this morning I want to uh, just teach on the importance of having a good testimony, a good testimony. Uh, we started there reading the last uh, chapter in the book of John, and of course, the Gospels themselves are, uh, are testimonies of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it's really important. They're, they're called the four Gospels because they teach on the, the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what the books are all about. And you think about what is a testimony, just by the definition, what is a testimony? A testimony is a declaration of truth or a fact. Right? It's, it's declaring something to be truth. That's a, it's a testimony. That's why people give their testimony in a, in a court of law. right? Because you're supposed to be declaring something that you know to be true. You're testifying to something that this is true. Obviously, we have a, a very important job as believers to testify to the truth of salvation and uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? There's, there's a lot of truth that we need to testify, so it's important to have a good testimony. Now, the Gospels themselves literally are, as I was just saying, they are a compilation of a testimony given by different individuals that can all uh, say for themselves, hey, these things happened, right? Uh, the the, the la almost the last verse, the second to last verse here in John 21, the Bible says this, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So this is the apostle John who is testifying of all these things. That's why this is how he closes out the book saying, look, okay, this is the apostle. This is the guy that testifies of all of these things. I'm the one bearing witness. I'm the one testifying and saying that these things are true. This is how it happened. Starting in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, starting off about Christ and saying, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? We, we, we know, you know, it starts talking about Jesus. It starts talking about His early life. It talks about all the miracles and the teachings and the doctrine, and it goes into all of these various things, and then going into, of course, His his crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead. And all of the Gospels are similar. And turn back, if you would, to Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. We see this at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Now, not all of the Gospels explicitly are saying, hey, this is a testimony, right? But we have it in two out of the four. And it's obvious that the other two also are accounts given from the perspective of somebody who was with Christ throughout his whole ministry. Amen. They are the witness. They are, and, and you know, they ought to be credible. They are credible witnesses. And a, another title, you know, I'm teaching on a good testimony, but a, another title could be a credible witness. Because we are to be credible witnesses. I mean, think about it. If, if someone's declaring something to be true to you, what, what are the types of things you're going to want to know? I mean, you're going to want to know a little bit about the person who's telling you these things. Right. I mean, you don't just, do you just believe everything that you hear? Just anyone that says anything like, yep, I believe it. You know, the simple believeth every word the Bible says. But we need to be prudent. We need to find out knowledge. We need to be diligent and understand, like, hey, is there credibility to this assertion? Is there credibility to this testimony? Right? It ought to be tried. It ought to be examined. Which is why our faith is not just some total blind faith. It's not this unreasonable, irrational faith. There is reasonability to it. There is rationality to it. it. It matches up and it makes sense with the way that our world works. We can see and observe the way everything works and it fits together with the Word of God perfectly. So the, the observational truths that we see can be, are, are, you know, the, the Word of God 
is confirmed through all of those things. And even just the way that we're built with our conscience, with, you know, all that we see about us, all of creation speaks to the creator, speaks to the glory of God. And so, so but it still all has to be taken by faith in the end. Ultimately, there's still this lack of a, of a 100% guarantee, verifiable proof. It must be taken by faith, but it is not irrational faith. It, there is evidence supporting the faith of the testimony that's given to us. And at the end of the day, anybody giving any testimony, if you're going to, you, you have to decide, do I believe that or not? Right? I mean, so, so any way that you determine any type of truth, it's going to have to come down to some level of faith. So if you're in a court of law and people are saying, hey, no, no, I saw this guy, you know, what are you going to do? You have to, you have to rely on people's testimony. Now, obviously, there's things that are, that are more, uh, that don't rely on people these days with forensic evidence and some other things that can, that can work together to try to establish the truth of a matter. But if someone's going to give a testimony, if someone's going to testify to something, at the end of the day, you have to determine whether or not what is being said is true. And, and the claim. And, and even in a court of law, all the forensic evidence is just that. It's evidence. There's still a claim being put forward. There's a plaintiff, whether that be the state, the government, saying this person commit this crime. That would be the testifying that this person is guilty of something. Everything else is the supporting evidence, right? So there's the testimony be given, hey, this person commit this crime. That's the complaint. And then everything else is going to be supporting evidence. So we have a testimony. We uh, have our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our sa you know, to be our Savior, that that is the way of salvation. There's a lot of evidence out there, but we need to be able to provide a good testimony and have and be a credible witness that these things are true. Luke 1.1, 1, 1, look at what the Bible says there. The Bible says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So this is a letter, literally like, like the, the, the gospel of Luke. Luke is writing this letter to Theophilus. And he's expressing, saying, look, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things, which are most surely believed among us. So there's plenty of people out there who are declaring these things that we all believe to be true. So there's a lot of people making this declaration. There's a lot of witness stating that these things are true. He's saying, so you know what I chose to do since I had perfect understanding of these things from the very beginning since he was a minister of the word, since these things were delivered, he says, unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. He was eyewitness to these things. He's testifying to these things. He's saying, I have perfect firsthand knowledge of these events. And he's saying, so I am going to provide this to you. So here's my testimony. And he's writing to Theophilus because I would imagine that Theophilus is someone who might find the testimony of the Apostle Luke as credible. The physician, the great, you know, someone like Luke. Oh, wow, here's somebody. I can believe what he has to say. I can at least take it seriously based on many things, many factors, right? And if we want to be effective, and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if we want to be effective, obviously your character is going to matter, And you think about the things of God are, are probably the most important things that we could ever talk to anyone about. If you are not found to be a trustworthy person just in general in some of the smallest matters, who in the world is going to listen to you or believe you 
if you try to talk about things that are extremely important, like their salvation, like where their soul's going to end up when they die. So it was really important to make sure that we have this doubt. Hey, th just for, the, for the, the word of God going forward, God used men as vessels, yes, but he's got to use some men that have a, a, a level of integrity and people who are going to be perceived as credible witnesses and not just total derelicts or people who are known for just saying anything for a buck. Right? There's plenty of people that'll prostitute themselves out there and say anything. It's called the mainstream media. They'll say whatever they're told to say for a quick buck. Right. And they'll testify to all manner of things. But to be credible, you need to find someone who has integrity. You need to find someone who's going to say, you know what? No, I'm only going to speak those things which the Lord speaketh. I'm only going to say those things that are true. I'm not going to confuse this and muddy up the waters and, and be this wishy-washy type of a, uh, of a testifier or someone who you don't exactly know what's your motivation. No, we're, we're sold out for this. We wholeheartedly believe this. We know these things to be true. And I have no, you know, there's no reason for anyone to question my integrity of whether or not I'm telling you the truth. These are the type of people that the Lord is going to use. He used, uh, you know, when he even just bringing Jesus Christ in this world, that the Bible talks about Joseph and Mary as just being uh, devout people who are had good character Character, you know, it doesn't go really far in depth, but we know that they were chosen specifically to be the, the human parents on this earth of Jesus Christ, to raise him, to bring him up. They had to have a good testimony before the Lord in order to be in that position. We know that Joseph was a just man. He looked to the law, even when it came down to what he was trying to determine whether or not he wanted to stay with Mary when she was pregnant. It says he was a just man. He was looking to the law of God and, and you know, kind of discerning and determining what is he going to do about this information because it's a big deal. And on and on we can go, right? We know nobody is perfect, of course. And there's different people in the Bible who have had their share of sin. But at the end of the day, God's not using... These people that have a bad rap, a bad testimony, that were known charlatans and known, you know, uh, uh, people who would just be deceivers to be the ones that he's using to carry forward his word. It doesn't mean you can't serve God, of course. I'm not saying that. So if in times past, if you were someone who was a habitual liar, someone who couldn't be trusted, it doesn't mean you can't serve God. You can serve God, but you need to work even harder now to try to build up a good reputation. But that's also why there's qualifications for things like a pastor. Because a pastor is, 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 is not only the teacher, but he's the figurehead and someone who's administering the church. And you can't be someone who's you know, accused of riot and unruly and, and someone who, who has a bad reputation. Why? Because this job is important and being able to carry forth the word of God is important. So you need to have some level of character that's been established to be a credible witness. There's a couple of, of verses here I just wanted to show because we're ta I'm talking about a testimony, so I wanted to go a little bit in depth. We saw that... Uh, the, the Gospels are testimonies because they're things that are being stated or declared to be fact. But things, our actions can also be a testimony in themselves. And I just want to show you some biblical examples of this. Because the actions can be demonstrating a truth. And the reason why you do that, even if you're not physically, like audibly speaking, you can have a testimony through your actions. So look at Matthew 8, verse number 3. The Bible says, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So this man, was a leper, came to Jesus. He wanted to be cleansed. Jesus heals him. Look at verse 4. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So as soon as Jesus saves him, spiritually, you know, like the, the, the spiritual implication here, the, the, the um, what, what's, uh, good night, why is my brain so foggy? The um, symbolism. symbolism, thank you, yes, yes. The symbolism is that this man is receiving 
healing, right? I mean, he physically is healed of leprosy, but this, the spiritual symbolism is that is how it's just as easy to be saved, right? Spiritually speaking, we are in a condition like we're spiritual lepers because of our sin. We have this disease that can't, it's incurable disease of sin. But when we go to Jesus and we call on Jesus and ask Jesus to save us, hey, we're washed clean as white as snow, right? He, he cleanses us of all sin. So then what he says, it says, okay, now go offer your gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them, which symbolically would be now go and sin no more, yeah. right? Look, he saved you from sin. Now how about you show the, the testimony and give honor to the testimony and the law of God by now living a life that's going to be following the law and looking to the law to, to uh, guide you into how you could live righteously in this lifetime. You're already saved, you're already cleansed, but now go forth and do this. And by going back and observing the Mosaic law, he's saying you're giving a testimony unto them. Yes, you are saved by Jesus, but give that testimony unto the law that it's good. That it's still a good law. That action is the testimony. So, uh, one more example is in front of Mark chapter 6. There's many other examples, but these are two I chose. Because I want you thinking about your testimony being more than just your words. The words matter. The words are a declaration of something that's true, that you are testifying to. So, of course, your character needs to be there. But not just your words, but your actions also will testify to the things that you believe. They could give a testimony to other truths by your actions. Here is an action that Jesus commanded his disciples when he sent them out to preach the gospel that in itself was its own testimony. Verse number 10 of Mark chapter 6, the Bible reads, And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So he's saying, when you go into a city, and they don't receive you, and no one wants you, and no one wants to hear you, and you're not going to be received in, he says, you know what? Literally, shake the dust off your feet. Because when you do that, I added that part. I don't, I don't know if they did that or not, but you're, you're, you're showing something, right? It's like, you know what? Fine. You, you don't want to hear the truth? You don't want to hear the word of God? Yep. Let's move on. We're going to the next town. And, and it was something they were supposed to do because it's a testimony. Because people can see that. They're watching them be like, they're like looking out the blinds. Did you call the HOA? <laughs> like, you know what? You and your HOA are all going to die and go to hell. <laughs> it's going to be worse. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. And look, that's true. It's true. No, look, it's not, we're not bitter against the people, right? That's right. It just, it's a statement of fact. And you shouldn't be bitter. We'll put it that way. You shouldn't be bitter. You shouldn't be bitter against people that don't want to hear you. Yeah. Right? That's their choice. Mm -hmm. However, it needs to be shown this is a big deal, right? It's, it's, that, it's that witness to the people who didn't want to hear your witness <laughs> just through that action of shaking off the dust of your feet. But it's a testimony in itself. So, so our actions obviously matter, not just to support our witness, but even to be a witness in themselves. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. Actually, while I'm still on this same point, you, if you get to Titus 2, put a bookmark there and go to 1 Peter chapter 3. They're not that far from each other. First Peter chapter three, and I've got I've got a few references that that bring up your conversation. 
and I've expressed this many times in the past, but just so you know, in, in case you haven't heard this before, or maybe you don't, you're not, you're not uh, understanding, you know, of course, some of the words in the Bible are a little bit older words, and meanings have slightly changed over time. So when we read, you know, the Bible that was translated in 1611, some words are a little bit different today because they're not used always exactly the same way. They're similar, but not exactly the same. When we talk about conversation, you can look this up for yourself. Conversation is more that we talk about conversation of just like if I were to sit down with Brother Michael and we talk to each other, that's a conversation. Oh, I had a conversation with Brother Michael. But that's not the way that the Bible uses that word. Okay, that could be part of your conversation. But conversation is a broader word talking about just kind of how you carry yourself and how you live your life is your conversation. So just with that in mind, when we read the Bible here, it makes perfect sense. Verse number one, the Bible says, likewise, ye wives, there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number one, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, talking about the husbands obeying not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Not necessarily the things that they say, but the way that they're, they're living their life, the way that they, uh, uh, and, and, it, and it continues on to express this, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And if we keep reading, I wasn't going to go through this just for sake of time, you're going to see more of the things that a good, godly, submissive wife, the attributes, not adorning themselves with gold or pearls or costly or way, and all these other things that, that God is describing, like how the attributes of a godly wife. And what the Bible's teaching us here is that if you have an unbelieving husband, Right? So you got married, maybe the wife gets saved, the husband didn't get saved. He says, be in your subjections that if any obey not the word, and not even just salvation here. I mean, if someone's just not obeying the word, you know, whether that be salvation or not, you do what's right. And then when you are providing that testimony, not just verbally, right? Not necessarily trying to... Uh, um, get too far out of bounds with like teaching your husband as opposed to your husband being the, the teacher and a guy in your house. He could just see the manifestation of you living a godly life. And I'm not saying you can't give the gospel to your husband if, if he's not saved. So don't take that the wrong way. But the, the, the way that you live your life, if you are living a godly life, your husband's going to see that. He's going to pay attention and start noticing that. Right, because the, the assumption, at least, is I think uh, it's fair enough to say that it, it, either the wife was just living really worldly or wasn't saved at all, and now all of a sudden she's starting to live more. Look, that's going to show forth. And that conversation, the way that you act, will have an impact. That's a testimony in itself. Hey, there's maybe something to this. Maybe I should treat this a little bit more seriously. Maybe I should look into this a little bit. And when you get saved, we all ought to, in baptism, you know, die to our old self, die to the sinful man, bury that sinful man, because look, we're all sinners, so if you can overcome that sin through Christ, like we do spiritually, but also walking in the Spirit, everybody, you know, people who know you will notice a difference. Amen. If you're walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh people will notice that difference. And that is a good conversation to have. That is a good testimony just in itself. I mean, it was a testimony for my wife. When, when you know, we had known each other, and, and this is a good example of someone who already was saved but was just living real worldly. She had no idea what my faith was back when we first met. I was saved, but other people had no idea what I believed because I was not walking in the Spirit at all. I was just like any other person out in the world. But then when we reconnected after many years and after I'd already started, got plugged into a good church, started changing my life, then it was, wow, you're different. <laughs> but you know what? That was a testimony in itself. Yes, I preached a testimony, but I, I, I've got a feeling that that testimony that I'm saying had much more impact then if I didn't change at all, and I'm like, hey, come on over, we'll have some beers, we'll go, you know, whatever. Why would you want to hear anything about the Bible? I mean, people just already inherently know 
in general what the Bible teaches. Thankfully, right? Thank God. There's, there's a lot of just real basic elementary knowledge out there kind of about what the Bible teaches to the point to where it's, it's pretty obvious when you're a hypocrite, <laughs> right? So if you're just living as a total worldly lifestyle, it's like, you're a Christian? Like, really? So people will be like, no, you're not. Right. Even unsaved people are going to be like, no, you're not. Because yeah. you should know, there, there should be a difference, right? There should be a difference in the way that you live. If you're going to claim to be a Christian, yes, there ought to be. And that's going to affect your testimony and the things that you say. So in, 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 you know, in the case with, with me and my wife, she knew right away that there was something different. Oh, you're inviting me over and now you've got your Bible out and you're asking me about being saved? <laughs> like, like, wow, you've changed. I think she even said that. Did you say that? I'll, yeah, she said that. I'll trust her testimony. My, <laughs> my memory isn't always that great. But she did say that. And, um, you know, and people who know me in the past, high school, you know, we ought to be living a life that's, that's, that is separated, that we're, we're different. And that will just strengthen the testimony of the things that are true. Because if you really believe these things, hey, why don't you live by it then? Right? right? I mean, it's what people think. And it's not a bad thought. But, but let that sink in. If you really believe these things, how are you living? Do you really believe that? I mean, that, these, now, and I don't want you to doubt your salvation, okay? I don't. But this is the very reason why I did have any thoughts of doubt in my own mind about my own salvation was literally just because I was, I was living, I was just going like, you know, because I, I struggled. Because I was saved, I did have the Holy Spirit, and I struggled with sin. And, but it, there are times I'm just going like, did I, do I even really, how can I say I believe this stuff? It was more of a question like, how can I say I believe this stuff? Because, I mean, it's, it makes sense. How can I say I believe this stuff if I continue to do these things? I never got to the point where I thought I wasn't saved, but the doubts were there, right? But, but ask yourself the question, right? I think it's fitting, and I think it's a good question. We ought to have a godly sorrow that worketh repentance if you are living a wicked life, if you are living a sinful life, if, you, if, you aren't, if your life is not reflecting the things that you believe, then you know what? You need to analyze that and start making the changes so you can say, you know what? No, I really do believe this, and I'm going to prove this by showing it through my works, through my life, through my conversation. And that in itself does have an impact. Now, I say it has an impact. It's not a replacement for preaching the gospel. Okay, we don't believe in lifestyle evangelism in the sense that, okay, all you have to do is be happy and just live this life where you're just full of joy, and then people are just going to come up to you and ask you, hey, why are you so happy? Look, no. You have to preach the gospel, Amen. right? You need to, the, the conversation is a testimony to the word of God, but you need to like testify that these things are true. You need, you need to go above and beyond just the way that you live to actually make the statement and to show, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is ultimately how people are going to be saved. But seeing your actions will help provide you to be a good, credible witness. They're going to give extra impact to what you're saying just in the sense that people might be thinking, hey, I might be able to believe what this guy's saying. If it made a difference in his life, then maybe there's something to this, right? Things that people can see. It's one little bit of evidence is what it is. It's one extra bit of evidence. Obviously, the power is still in the word of God. The salvation is going to come through God's word. People still need to hear the gospel. They need to hear it all. They need to be convinced, persuaded that that's true, and they need to put their faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we want to have as much evidence that we can provide as possible and, and be the most credible witnesses that we can be. The Bible says this in, I had you turn to Titus chapter 2. I'll just read from Isaiah 59, 12. While well, you go back to Titus 2, Isaiah 59, 12, the Bible reads, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. So when you, you know, the sin you have in your life is going to testify against you. It's not going to be in your favor. It's going to testify you, and it's going to testify against just to anybody, like, well, you're not, you know, you say you believe, but you're doing all this. 
And look, everyone's a hypocrite to some extent, but it's, it's still like, it's not an excuse, right? right. Yeah. Amen. It's a fact that we have to accept, but we always strive and work for not being hypocrites. Titus chapter 2, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads this, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. There's going to be people, obviously, in opposition to the things that we testify. So we're testifying the truth through the Bible, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. You know, we're exalting this and say, hey, no, this is true. And there's going to be people who oppose that. Amen. Now, those people that oppose that, look, you need to make sure you have sound speech. Sound. It's good. It's airtight. You're, you know, people aren't going to be able to attack you and attack your character and attack the things that you say because they can't be condemned. Right? They, can't, they have nothing to say against what you're saying. You need to have good, solid, sound speech, things that make sense, and be able to, to put forth the word so that those on the contrary part you can just be ashamed because they got nothing evil to say about you. Because if they can't attack the message, they're going to attack the messenger. But the best testimony is going to be from a messenger that also can't be attacked. But go ahead. Hey, you know, like Jesus said, hey, which of you convinceth me of sin? Now, I look, I know that if someone looks close enough, they're going to find sin in us. They couldn't in Jesus, but it's just like, hey, well, hey, what do you, you know, his words were perfect. That's why we use his words. We use the word of God to get people saved because they are perfect. Yeah. But um, and turn, now turn back if you would. I should have had you keep your place there. First Peter chapter 2. Because this speaks exactly to the same point in Titus chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible reads, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So we're strangers and pilgrims now being born again. We're a new creature. We're not of this world. So we're in this world, but because we're not of this world, now we're strangers, we're foreigners, we're pilgrims. We're just here for a short time because we have a heavenly home. That's where our real home is. So now we're just kind of visiting. We're just here temporarily. So he's saying, because of this, because you're pilgrims, because you're strangers, abstain, withhold from the fleshly lusts. They war against your soul. They have nothing to do with them. Having your conversation Honest among the Gentiles, a.k.a. among the unbelievers, okay? You ought to be someone that's known to be honest, not a liar, not someone who's like, oh, man, that guy did work for me and he stiffed me or, you know, I did work for him. He stiffed me on the bill or whatever, you know, be honest, be upfront. Don't be lying about things. Don't be casting shade and trying to get people in trouble. You ought to be someone whose conversation, and people say, you know what? That's an honest guy. Even if it has nothing to do with the Bible, be like, hey, I could conduct business with this guy. I could lend this guy my car. I could do whatever. And I could trust him. Because he's just known to be, uh, uh, his conversation, his manner of being is an honest guy. It says that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, because that's going to happen, Right? Especially the enemies of the gospel are going to try to find anything they can. They're going to demonize you and say you're so hateful and all this other stuff. But honestly, do you know what wins people over? Because I've seen this happen I don't know how many times. And I'll use Pastor Anderson as the best example because he's had the most shade cast on him in the media and everything else. But you know what? Anyone who meets the guy, they don't feel the same way. Amen. Except for the total reprobates who just hate God anyways. Yeah, they're going to keep on hating. But the normal people out there that only see the, the, what they see on the television and they see the lies that are cast forth and the, and the, the way that they, they want to portray someone who's preaching the word of God, when they actually meet someone like that, someone, you know, in person, they meet in person, oh, wow, you're actually really nice. Oh, what, you know, it's like, yeah. And things are done decently and, and honestly and, and transparently and, you know, like, 
There's no, there's no reason to be able to speak evil. And that's why, and I'm not saying he's perfect. It's just, it's just one of those things that I know, like, like I know him. He's a great guy. He's helped me tremendously, and he's sacrificed a lot of things to help me and others, and I've witnessed that as well. And, and you know, very nice, very personable, but that's not the impression that those that hate God are going to try to give you of him. And they'll do the same thing to me here, right? Now, we haven't had that much attention, and hey, you know what? That's great. I'm fine with that. Um, but at some point, it's going to come. People are going to try slandering, if not your name, my name around, and then your association with me or with this church or something like that and they're going to try to speak evil of you. Oh, yeah, these people, they're, you know, and, and people try to do that already as a guilty by association, even just as independent fundamental Baptists. Because there's been plenty of wicked people in other churches doing other things, doing really wicked things that are going to try to bring a slander on the fundamentalists and the independent fundamental Baptists and everything else. Oh, they're cults, and they have all this, this, this bad sin and all this other stuff going on. Look, they don't all. Oh, but people will make that claim and just try to lump you in. But, well, that's why we have to show, look, no, we don't. That's not us. And are there wicked people that might creep in? Of course. But we have to deal with that. We have to deal with it transparently. We have to deal with it justly and rightly. And it's all you can do. But you have to make sure for yourself, for your testimony, because that's what you're responsible for before God, that you have a good testimony. And, that, and, and that's going to go a long way that when you have your conversation, as it says here in verse 12, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by good, your good works, which they shall behold, they're going to see it, right? Because if you're doing it, they should see it. If you're not doing anything, they're not going to see anything. Your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. They'll be able to glorify God Oh, because I have a good conversation, because I'm honest, because I am representing Jesus Christ in a way that the, that the people, the naysayers, have nothing to say against us doing anything evil. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this point here. You can see what it says. I think it's relatively clear. And um, I'll go into an, another sermon, just the whole, all the ways that, that we should follow the government and things like that. But it's not just total authority either. It's not like... You just do everything that they say, Amen. right? There's limits, okay? But I think the sentiment here is, in general, hey, have a good testimony. Even if you don't agree with some stupid laws out there, if they're not contradicting the word of God and you can still live your life peaceably, then just do it, right? Even in some of the smallest matters, because it may not be that big of a deal, but it could influence the way that other people see you or it'll give them some more ammunition to use against you, right? So, I mean, just think about some of the stupidest things or the smallest things. So, you know what? Just, just follow that. Just follow that. Verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Your well-doing will speak volumes over the ignorant, the people who just don't even know, because people throw accusations against you. They don't even know anything about you. They just want to fight against what you're fighting for and will say all manner of evil against you falsely for Christ's sake, but they're put to silence when you're just doing well Amen. with well-doing. Like, Go ahead. You, you want to say I'm all these things, bring it up here. Testify of what I'm doing wrong. And they ought to have nothing to say. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Turn, if you would, to... Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll just read this story from Daniel 6 for you. I think Daniel is a perfect example of someone who has a great testimony... And people tried to use it against or tried to find fault with him, but they couldn't. This is how we ought to live. 
to have a good testimony. We ought to be like Daniel. Daniel 6, verse 1, the Bible reads, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. So what he did here was he distributed the way that people were going to be ruling in his kingdom. So there was princes at the more local level, 120 of them over all the different areas, over the realm that, that he was over. And then he had another group, the middle management group, right, to, to shield and protect him as the king from anyone doing anything wrong in those other provinces. So he only had to manage the three guys that were over all the 120. It, it provides that extra layer of protection to hold the king responsible or whatever for things that are going wrong. He could just be like, oh, no, I gave that job to this, you know, whatever. That's how he designed it. But the three obviously have a lot more authority because they're over the 120. And Daniel was the number one guy. So Daniel is like next in line behind the king himself as far as the authority or power structure that he set up here. And that's because that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Look at verse number three. Or I'll read this for you. You're not there, probably. Uh, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. The king sees what Daniel's doing. Hey, look, Daniel's got his act together. Daniel's wise. Daniel's smart. He, he, he's able to handle these things. He's got the spirit of God guiding him into all truth and wisdom. And you know what? That helps you in all areas of life. When you live righteously, when you gain wisdom, when you learn Proverbs, when you learn the Bible, and you learn these great truths, this carries forward to help you in all aspects of your life, even just on the job. So you put forward the good values. You're a hard worker. You're someone who knows how to labor. You're someone who's honest. You're someone who's faithful. You're someone who doesn't complain. You're someone who can get the job done. All these things are great assets when you're out on the job. They will help you put these into practice. You should have them in practice anyway so that you can have a good testimony of God and of Christ and of the things of God. And then on top of that, you gain knowledge, right? Not just your character being improved, not just having good quality or good traits by just being a good person, we'll call it that way, right? But then gaining knowledge and gaining understanding in the ways that people work, in the way that things work out in this world, and having that knowledge goes a long way. That knowledge allows you to foresee things that are going to happen when you understand human nature better, when you understand how, how people's actions work, you just start to understand more about the world in general. It helps you, especially in positions like this, to be even more valuable. And you get that through God's wisdom, the wisdom that the Holy Ghost teaches, the wisdom that is found in the Word of God, more than anything else, will help and guide you to be in a position like this. So Daniel is exalted. And, and God allowed Daniel to be elevated too, obviously. Um, but then these other guys, these other presidents, they don't like that. This Daniel, right? There's no way they're ever going to get promoted because Daniel's just this goody two-shoes and he's just good at everything he's doing. And they're trying to find a fault with him. It says in verse 4, then the presidents and, prin and princes, so it's not just the presidents, but even the princes below him, they're less like, everybody doesn't, no one likes Daniel. But the king loves him. The king's like, hey, this is a great worker, right? The other people might hate him. And they're trying to do everything they can. But you know what? He doesn't work for them. He's working for the king. But the king's, king's happy with what he's doing. But people have it out for him nonetheless. The presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. So they're seeking it out. And that's one thing you have to understand, too. If you're going to serve God and you're going to be, have this testimony, and you're going to testify that things of the, the Word of God are true, don't be surprised if people are trying to seek out now your sins and, and actually actively watch you and try to find where you're screwing up and where you're at fault, Right? And it, like early on in our church is where we had someone call in about our, our certificate of occupancy from the fire department. or so, You know, it's like, 
They're trying to find some fault. And like, literally, this, this is what was happening. It wasn't a friend of the church that was saying, oh, I think you guys aren't being very safe. You need to have this. It was someone that wanted to shut down our services that was calling to get us in trouble one way or another. Because they even said that someone called it. It's not like they're doing some random inspection. Someone called it in. And you know what? That was an area where we should have had our ducks in a row. But, you know, by the grace of God, we're able to just continue going. We got that all covered. And now, lesson learned. And, and we keep up with everything that we're supposed to by the laws of this land and doing things the way we do it. That's why we get the inspection. That's why we do things and submit the, the stuff to, to follow the ordinances of man and just be like, whatever. I don't, I don't want to give, like, like what a stupid reason for our ministry to be, to be halted and interrupted here because of, because of some code or ordinance. Well, I mean, think about that. Like, oh, we want to expand and make a little bit more room, but then we just don't follow any of that stuff and give someone an opportunity to say, oh, hey, look, they did this and they didn't get the right permission. And then like possibly just be shut down in the sense of, of some government official saying, well, no, you didn't do things right here. So, so we're going to close these doors until it's all fixed or something, you know, whatever. What a dumb reason, yeah. right? When it would be so, when we could easily just comply and, and, and move on and focus on the things that really matter. Because at the end of the day, it's an annoyance to have to deal with some of these things. But so what? Right? So what? Let's just be known as the people, you know what? Strong Baptist Church, they're good. They're not, they're not, a, a, they're, they're not trying to, to, you know, buck the system and, and not want to do, you know, comply with, with the laws of, of the city or the, you know, the, the, the county or whatever. Look, we're going to do everything we can and be peaceable and be upright in the community. Right? As much as possible and only put our foot down when, no, we must do this because the Bible says so. And that's it. And we hold to the integrity of the Bible above the laws of man. But otherwise, yeah, so what? We keep doing it. And Daniel, I'm sure, because they weren't able to find any reason, Daniel was following the laws. Only when it was going to be in conflict with the law of God was he not. Otherwise, they'd have a bunch of things to say against him. But what they said was this. It says they sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. And this is concerning the kingdom, concerning his job, concerning his duties, concerning all the things of the laws of the land. They couldn't find any fault against him. So they had to conjure up a way to where they knew they could make him come in conflict with the law of the land. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They literally had to make up a law to be in conflict with God's law in order to make Daniel be at odds with the law, with the law of the land, because he had that good of a reputation. Right now, look, you can't control that. All you can do is just make sure you got your priorities right and say, you know what? No, we're following the law of God. But what, is, what do we learn or what we see from this lesson? Hey, Daniel had everything together. And he won over the favor of the king too because when the king finally realizes what he did, the stupid law he enacted, he was like, oh man, I really screwed up, right? And then he, he was still on Daniel's side. He still cared about Daniel. And of course, God kept him through it as well which is most important, right? All right, I'm going to close up here. Um, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 just to, to illustrate, as many of you probably know, is a, a, a well-known passage, at least in this church, that we do, we do have a truth that we need to testify. We, we have a job. And the Bible says in, in verse number 17 there, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. The gospel. We have this testimony. We have to proclaim this truth. We are here in Christ's stead. Christ is no longer walking on this earth and leading people to the Father. He's not doing that. So we now have this job committed unto us, reconciling the world unto Christ. And if you are an ambassador, you're representing somebody else. And if the person you're representing is flawless and perfect and sinless and holy, then how are you going to be able to represent that person if you're not trying to be as much as possible a reflection of who he is? Amen. It's our duty. So you, you, have, you want to be a good ambassador? Try to look the part, fit the part, be the part of an ambassador. You're representing Christ. You're not representing yourself. So we need to have that good testimony. We need to have a good conversation. Just like Christ, the only way they could get Christ was false accusations. It's the only way they were able to convict him of anything. Well, you ought to be living a life such that the only way that people are going to convict you of anything and find evil in you is that it's false. Because you are an ambassador and you're representing Christ, that ought to be the way that you live your life. The last place I want to turn is John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is actually the verse that, that kind of prompted this sermon. This, this verse stood out to me as it, it never had before but just proclaiming the same truth of having this good testimony and being able to proclaim the truth as someone who is reliable, as someone that people can trust. And the result of being able to do that is people will get saved. Amen. And again, the word of God is what saves, Amen. but we need to be able to have as much evidence as possible for reasonable people to accept the gospel. And one little part of that that could be helpful is the way that you present the gospel and who you are in delivering the word of God. We, we are vessels that God uses. And we're imperfect vessels, but the Bible teaches that we ought to be meat for his use, like ready for his use by purging out the leaven, purging out the sin so that we could be used to do greater and mightier works for God because more people will receive it. More people will listen. You're being a better ambassador. John 10, look at verse number 40, the Bible reads, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. We don't have to do miracles to get people to believe us, right? I mean, if we did, we'd be in really bad shape because I have not witnessed anybody here actually perform a miracle like Christ did, right? Miracles of healing or even just uh, with the gifts of, of the tongue or other gifts of the spirit that, that people might have, that, that God had poured out on those that believed in the New Testament or in the early church. But John didn't have any miracles. John did no miracles. John was a real simple man. John was out in the wilderness. He was just out preaching the word of God no fancy clothing, no fancy food, no fancy anything. But he was a man that didn't mince words. He's a man that said things the way that they were. The way that he saw them, hey, this is the truth. Whether, whether it was against the king, against uh, uh, Herod, right? 
against Herodias, against Philip, against any of the people in charge, or against the Jews, against the Pharisees. It doesn't matter. He just proclaimed the truth. And he stuck to it. And he was consistent. And, and he taught, and he taught a hard message. And people heard the message that John spake. And then when Jesus came, because remember, he came to prepare the way for the Lord, the voice crying in the wilderness, that was John, John the Baptist. Then when Jesus shows up, he's like, they're like, they're confirming, wow, everything that he said is true. And there's no coincidence there. And then many believed on him there. As a result of a lot of the plowing that John was doing. They didn't believe right away when John testified. But then when they were introduced to Jesus, when they saw Jesus, when, when he was doing his ministry, it helped confirm, wow, hey, everything that he said, there it is. It's true. Amen. Everything he said is true. A confirmation on the testimony. He was a good I had a good witness to the truth. And even if you don't see someone get saved immediately, have that good witness. Amen. Right. It could impact. And look, this type of influence and this type of impact is going to help, probably going to help the people that you care about the most. Because when we go out to the door, they don't know you. Right? So it's it's really the word of God or anything visible that they might see about you, your really surface level stuff. But this is going to have the most impact to those that are closer to you, to the people who either once knew you or know you, family members, people who are just waiting. You know, you join this church and be like, oh, it's just a phase. Oh, they're just kind of testing things out. They've already been to these other churches and stuff. No, you need to stay faithful. You need to put these words into practice. You need to demonstrate, not just for yourself and your own relationship with the Lord, but also for the sake of other people that are going to see you and be able to see the testimony, to see your conversation and be like, you know what? This is different. This isn't like the time that he went to the, 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 the Buddhist camp or went to, you know, whatever. Like, like if you're known to be someone who's, who's tried different religions, this, this is different. Or this isn't like when he, you know, whatever, right? Any, any things that you might have been known to have done, right? That would have been maybe foolish things. <laughs> now it's different. Whatever that may be, now it's different. Because they're actually seeing legitimate changes. They're seeing you grow. They're seeing your testimony. They're seeing, look, this is who I am. This isn't a pretense. This isn't in guile. This isn't fake. I'm not just trying to put on a mask for people to think that I am so holy or righteous. It's just part of who I am. Amen. And some of you specifically, I'm not going to bring up anyone by name, but, I, but, but I've, I've had conversations with people where it's like, you know, their family is just, you still cast shade because of sins of their past. But you know what? Over time... You could win them over, yes. potentially, right? Obviously, uh, it's, they still have a choice to make on what they're going to do. But, but don't hinder that. Continue to be the good example. Continue to just show, no, this is true. God's word doesn't fail. And I'm going to live to you know, the best life that I can and, and not allow people to give them occasion to speak falsely about the right way, about the way of truth. That's what the false prophets do. They come in and they, they're an actor and they want to put on the IFB suit and, and try to infiltrate and become looking like one of us in order to then cast shade and, and bring about a bunch of damage when they didn't believe to begin with. That's how they operate. Second Peter 2 goes more into depth about that, about bringing uh, uh, the, the, the way of truth being evil spoken of because of their evil and pernicious ways. But that ought not to be us, right? Be a good ambassador. Have a good witness. Be, be someone who's credible, trustworthy, and 
I guarantee you, you'll see more results just in general because God will use you more and provide just that extra ample evidence for people to be convinced. And, and like I said, it's going to be more so in people that you're closer with than just at the door. So you care about your loved ones. Hey, sell out to serving the Lord, right? Cha real, make the real changes to, be, to, to, to have that, the Word of God impact your life. That's kind of a side benefit of, of your family and loved ones, but the, I mean, the real benefit is going to be just for you getting right with God. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. We thank you for um, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And um, Lord, we had to take that on faith. All of us here are believers. We, we believe on faith. We thank you for the, the men of God that you've used in the past that um, had a good testimony and were able to uh, preach your word without people having evil to say against them, Lord. And we thank you, of course, mostly for Jesus Christ, who had the best testimony and was perfect, was without sin, and uh, against which no one had anything that they could legitimately say anything against, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be good ambassadors for Christ and that we would um, just be able to exhibit the, the life that, that a believer should exhibit by uh, putting into practice your words. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.